I'm going to wrap up by talking about making customer centricity profitable. So we, we first spent a lot of time defining what customer centricity is and motivating reasons why managers might think about moving in that direction. And then we, we dove into some of the tactics, acquisition, retention, development, to better understand them, to better understand how we use a customer-centric lens, a celebration of heterogeneity, to, to uh, run each of those tactics and the interplay among them uh, more effectively. But now let's put it all together and, in fact, bring it back to some of the concepts and methods that Barbara laid out as well to, to get the, the full picture of how a customer-centric enterprise would operate and potentially be more profitable than a product-centric enterprise. So it all begins with customer lifetime value. If you can't calculate customer lifetime value, if you don't have the data, if you don't have the analytical capabilities, if you don't have the, 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 the information technology to do so, you're lost. You really need to be able to look at your historical data and come up with a projection, just an estimate, of what, what each customer is going to be worth. And you need to be able to do that on a regular basis. And let's be real clear here. When I'm talking about customers, I'm not necessarily talking about consumers. So you might be a B2B firm and you're looking at the lifetime value of each one of your distributors. So I'm agnostic about how we define customers. But however your customers are, you need to come up with this projection about what they're going to be worth in the future. And you need to have the capability to be updating that projection on a regular basis, not just, hey, let's go out there and, and figure out what, what these lifetime values are. Some companies are going to do it on a daily basis. Some companies will do it on a quarterly or yearly basis. It all depends on, on the rhythm of the company, the flow of the data, and their capabilities for doing so. But it's important to be able to do so at a reasonably regular basis. After we have these CLV estimates, what do we do with them? It's very tempting, if you think about one-to-one -one marketing, to figure out the, the wants and needs of each and every customer and, and send them exactly the right message at exactly the right time in order to get them to do the kind of thing that we want them to do. That's difficult. That's expensive. That's risky. So what we really want to do is to go back to the ideas that Barbara first put forth, the idea of segmentation. We're going to want to break customers up into relevant groups. She discussed it, I discussed it, but in my case, I want to break customers up into groups that, that we can actually um, really see and measure actionable differences. So as, a, as I said before, we want to break people up based on uh, uh, when we acquired them, based on what product they first uh, uh, acquired from us, uh, based on what campaign they first responded to. Let's think about different kinds of acquisition characteristics. As I've said numerous times, let's tag customers when we acquire them. And again, cleanly associate different aspects of their acquisition with them. So when we watch them over time, and we tend to say, hey, you know what? We tend to see really valuable customers who were associated with a particular product or a particular marketing campaign. So let's segment customers on relevant characteristics, which might be, in fact, they recommend to be associated with acquisition, but it could be on other bases as well. But let's segment, and when we look at these segments, let's, let's look at them not just based on the number of customers in the segment, but let's look at the CLVs. Let's understand which segments tend to be associated, on average, with fairly high CLV. And we're going to obviously want to allocate more of our marketing spend towards those segments. The really hard part is something that I haven't really discussed, is how we do that initial allocation. How do we take a budget and, and, and spend it on acquisition, retention, development? I've told you at the margin, we might want to spend a little bit more money on acquisition, but that doesn't mean all of the money on acquisition. So that's a real challenge, is figuring out how to do that kind of budgeting. You know what? Companies tend to do that reasonably well. Companies, through trial and error, through experience, usually come up with a, a, a reasonable allocation of those activities. Even if I want a, a company to, to just add an extra dollar or two to acquisition, they tend to be getting it right. But a really important way to understand if you have the right kind of allocation, in fact, beyond allocation, a very important activity for a company to be doing all the time is experimentation. You, you always want to run little experiments where, where maybe you're varying the amount of spend on acquisition, retention, development, but even on a more micro level. We want to manipulate the kinds of marketing messages. Let's send different messages to different people at different times. 
and then be patient and track them and try to understand how different kinds of experimental manipulations will be associated with CLV. So what kinds of tactics are going to lead to appropriate changes in CLV and how is it going to vary for different kinds of customers? How, how will the impact of a particular experiment change for the different kinds of segments that we've come up with? It's just as companies need to have CLV built into their DNA, they also need to have experimentation built in. And again, that's going to be true whether we're talking B2B, B2C, online company, offline company. Experimentation is essential. It's easier to do in some situations than others, but you need to be always thinking about experimentation. Which experiments we're going to be running now? What experiment are we going to run next? How will the results of the current experiment inform us about what the right one would be to run next? And thinking long term about the results of those experiments. One of the big themes of everything that I've mentioned is this idea of bottoms up thinking. We're going to look at our customers, we're going to look at the segments of those customers, we're going to understand who are the really valuable segments of customers and what can we do to make them more valuable and find more customers like them. So as, as I discussed earlier, we're going to have these bottom-up perspectives to help us drive R&D decisions, to help us drive marketing spend decisions, to help us understand what kinds of products and services we should be offering and what kinds of marketing tactics we should be using to get those offerings out there. So this, this bottoms-up mentality always has to happen, but at the same time, there's this paradox, there's this juxtaposition between the bottoms-up thinking and the product-centric thinking that still has to take place for, for, for a large but relatively less valuable chunk of our customers. So it's, it's coming up with that, that just right balance. But all the time, we want to be looking at our different segments, we want to be thinking about their CLV and asking ourselves, which of those segments are the right kinds of role models for future acquisition activities? Too often, a company can get itself in trouble by saying, here is the valuable segment of customers. We're going after these kinds of customers and we're going to align all of our activities to make these customers more valuable and to find more like them. In fact, a very good example of this would be Harris Casinos. So you'll remember earlier I was uh, touting all the great things they did to help identify uh, who the good customers were and to create and extract value from them and that's what helped them rise to the top of their industry. And in fact, uh, many of you might be familiar with the terminology that they used to describe those really valuable customers. In fact, terminology that many companies use today uh, and that's the idea of whales. They described their really valuable customers as whales and they understood the characteristics, the behavioral and other kinds of characteristics of those customers who were and would be the most valuable. And let's find more like them. And what's interesting about this is that it proved to be very successful for Harris for a long period of time, but eventually their competitors caught on. Eventually their competitors who really hadn't done their homework looked at Harris, looked at the success that Harris was enjoying and saying, what is it that Harris is doing differently? Oh, they're acquiring particular kinds of customers. Well, thank you, Harris, for doing our homework for us. We're going to go after those customers as well. So you have to be thinking about competition. You have to be realizing that as you're identifying the really valuable customers, your competitors might be doing the same thing, either doing it on their own or just looking at you and trying to figure out uh, who those valuable customers are. So all the time you need to be thinking one step ahead. If we were to lose this valuable segment of customers, which one would we go after next? So you don't want to be putting all your eggs in one basket. You want to have multiple different kinds of segments who could be role models for your future marketing activities. But you want to recognize that times will change, whether it's due to competition, whether it's due to changes in the marketplace, and, and, and in many cases, you're going to have to ask yourself, are these the right role models that we want to use? And be prepared to come up with a new role model segment to guide your future acquisition, R&D, and other kinds of marketing activities. And the big part of all this, the bottom line of customer-centric thinking, is the idea that this process that I've just described isn't a one-time only deal. You need to be calculating CLV on a regular basis, 
You need to be running experiments on a regular basis. You need to be reallocating your marketing spend on a regular basis. You need to be evaluating the segments or sometimes coming up with a new segmentation scheme on a regular basis. The real success to customer-centric thinking being as it is future-looking, long-term oriented, is to repeat these tactics over and over and over again. Too often a company says, I'm going to go out there and do the CLV thing and I'm going to figure out who those valuable customers are and then I'm going to be rich. Well, it's not really that easy. It takes a while, first of all, to figure out how to do the CLV thing, how to estimate those models and drive decisions on the basis of them. And that's why you need to be not only calculating CLV on a regular basis, but changing all your management tactics associated with it on a regular basis as well. It's the second, third, fourth time that you go through all these steps that you'll really start to see the efficiencies of being able to do these steps uh, in, in, a, in a reasonable manner, but also the payoff, the effectiveness, the, the reallocation of dollars, the re-identification of the right kinds of customers. So it doesn't happen right away. You have to be patient. Again, that's a major theme of customer centricity. A lot of companies aren't willing to be patient. They want to see that payoff right now. If that's the case, maybe it's not for them. But for companies that are willing to learn, that are willing to experiment, that are willing to wait, that are willing to invest in the right kinds of customers and the perspectives and managerial practices associated with it, they can win in the long run. I encourage you to run some of the kinds of experiments. Uh, think about some of the companies that we've discussed. Even if you're not going to completely change the company, you're going to do little things here and there. Run a little experiment on the side to see if you can be customer-centric, what it takes, whether it's worthwhile. Uh, it, it's, it, you, you can't just say tomorrow, we need to be customer-centric. You need to be learning, experimenting, thinking very carefully. 